morning's seminar that ties together weeks of academic work conducted by students enrolled in my first year seminar course on investigation. For the past month, my students have been investigating the Rosenberg espionage case. The overall guideline for developing the first year seminar was to teach students critical thinking skills. My background as a social worker, academic, and federal investigator motivated me to develop this course on investigation. And for me, the concept of using criminal investigation to teach criminal, uh, to teach critical thinking and research skills was pretty much a natural blend of my professional interest and skills. So the class has been working on various aspects of investigation to include a psychosocial assessment of a serial killer, which was an exercise that I designed to increase their awareness of the psychological, biological, and sociological factors that uh, impact behaviors. My uh, social work students, my juniors are, are smiling at me because they know exactly what they were doing. However, the Rosenberg case seemed to be an excellent case for students to learn many of the aspects of critical thinking that we were looking at to, in our first year of seminar development. We initially focused on the environment of the era of the Rosenberg, which my students know and many of you know was uh, the era of McCarthyism, which we hope to never go back to. The media <coughs> frenzy surrounding the case provided an excellent example of how media can bias the human mind and affect our world on many different levels. Next, we looked at the participants in the Rosenberg case, and uh, Joshua Hammer is going to speak to that, one of our students. I'll, I'll let you do that in a little bit. Uh, students also looked into the backgrounds of the participants, and they worked <coughs> in groups to prepare the case, one side taking a prosecutor's stance and the other the defense. The research culminated in a semi-structured debate discussion about the material investigated, and both sides were very informed, and the interaction was very lively, as you will see in just a moment. The highlight of our class is our guest, Robert Mirapol, the Rosenberg's youngest son, who graciously accepted our invitation to speak to us and share more insights into his life and the connection between his parents' case to other present day issues. So one of the assignments, again, was the uh, discussion debate that our students uh, participated in. There was another assignment that I had created, and that was for the students to find someone who was old enough to remember this case, interview them, and video them. But unfortunately, because of the age of the case, it was most difficult for them to find <coughs> anyone who could remember the case. So what I've done and what my, my husband Jason Harmon has been so kind to video our class and to video this for us today uh, is to splice together some, some uh, segments of an interview that I had with my relatives, uh, my aunt and uncle, a 94 year old uncle, 87 year old aunt from West Virginia who listened to this case on a radio and out in West Virginia. So that gives you an idea where they were at. Uh, and they were kind enough to uh, let me interview them and let that be video. So I'm gonna show you a bit of that. We spliced that together with some sections of the discussion debate. Um, and hopefully, I'll be able to, to uh, do this properly so that our students in Point Pleasant can also see it. <coughs> yeah. I don't think he had the. They had the right people that that presented their case because it was done so shortly. Oh, it was the the trial was. Yes, the trial was so short that right away they wanted to, to do something with them, and they thought that they had already had a ring of of, uh, of people uh, involved with them that was given Russia. Right. Some of the information on the atom bomb. Right. Right. Okay, so um, on the table, uh, it wasn't very clear on what the table did. It was a micro, it was adjusted. It was precious in magazines, but 
but it was adjusted to um, microfilm. And does any of you guys know what microfilm is? Yeah. I remember of it, and that's about it. Do you, do you remember what you thought about it, about those well, people? Well, I, I, I did think about it, and I think it's what a shame it is to punish them like it did when there was dozens of people, maybe hundreds, that got away with things that were done, they done worse than what the Rosenberg did. Frank Lance was in the Army, and his wife was a typist. So doesn't that kind of like hint more to David and Ruth other than Phileas and Ethel? The clue word though is most likely there's no evidence showing that she was watched 24-7 a day. David Greenglass's book that he wrote, he said, frankly, I think my wife did the typing. Evidence? No, I didn't think that. I, I, I didn't think they had enough, even if they had any. They, uh, made it appear as if they had enough evidence to do what they did. Well, the only person who said Ethel did the typing was David, and he said that Ruth was the only one that remembered Ethel doing the typing. Are we going to solely blame Ethel on Ruth's convictions? He only said, he said that while he was under oath, and now he's going back and saying that he lied under oath saying that Ethel typed those. So what else did he lie about under oath? Well, obviously, period. But now, after so he's still he's lying. lying. <laughs> he could still be lying that But he's clear Ethel. now. He's not going to jail now. He's already served his time, so why would he lie now? And there are questionable arguments throughout. I mean, do you all think that, that these arguments, what they were accused of, are strong? They could be. Okay, well, what's the strength in them? What are the strongest arguments that the problem is? Okay, I have to say this. All right. David Greenglass was working in the Army directly with the Manhattan Project, which, as we know, was working on the atomic bomb. So wouldn't it make more sense for him to get the secrets, to go straight home, tell Ruth to type them up and send them straight to Russia instead of going, Okay, I got to tell Julius first, and then oh he can tell her. Oh, no, no, and then I got it. Okay, so so the argument here again is is that he is, and where is Los Alamos? Does everybody know where that's at? Yes, and where was Julius Rosenberg? New York City. So was there ever prosecutors? Do you know of ever a time? when uh, they traveled to meet each other? Well, How did he get this information? When I remember it was like a movie theater or something. Like, they dropped something off and like some of the box. Yeah, it was like some boxes and stuff. Jello box? Box. Uh, no, I believe what you're referring to is the Jello box, correct? <laughs> yes. You yes. see, the Jello box actually was a way to confirm that they were communists. They cut the box up into pieces and they had a match the pieces together whenever they need to confirm their identities. It actually wasn't a box. Yeah, it was a jello box that Julius Rosenberg gave one half to Harry Gold and the other half to David Greenblatt so when they met, they could pass information. And Supposedly. They, they, they about Ben Snyder. Ben Snyder. Him out. You can't roll him out. He can't roll him out. Why not? How did they find Ben Schneider? Who found him to testify? Uh, the FBI the day before. Yeah, he wasn't on picture. Like people yeah. don't change from one picture really to another unless it's a long thing. Contrary to the newspaper and the FBI photos, there's not going to be a significant difference. How did he not recognize them in the newspaper? But then when the FBI showed it, all of that's them. So yeah, he was. The thing was, with if he was in trial and he was asked to point to the people you took on, he took the pictures of. 
Well, if he was on trial, he would clearly see who was on each side because they sit right up front in the main table. He could have easily just thought, say, it was them two. Uh, I, I didn't like it. I, I, I felt it all the time that they shouldn't have uh, oh, me too. Yeah, executed them. As you know, the, the, ch the children were orphaned because they were sentenced to death. There were people that weren't even connected to the case, such as Fight Farmer, who came in strongly, strongly believing that they were wrongly sentenced. They were sentenced under an invalid law. That they, if they broke any law at all, they actually violated the Atomic Energy Act, which was put into place in 1945 and 1946 which isn't punishable by death, and it was the act stating how the government and actually civilians in the military are to deal with nuclear secrets. And it actually wasn't amended to actually even cover how other countries, like leaking information to other countries until 1954. It was actually amended after the Rosenbergs, because of the Rosenbergs, and this was actually considered heavily by the Supreme Court that this is what they, you know, this is the act that they defied, this is what, this is the law they broke, not what they were tried for. And the only reason that the stay, because there was actually a stay on their execution because more than one person actually believed that this could be correct and that they might not need to be punished by death, they would still get a lengthy prison sentence, but they would not die. And the only reason it, the stay was took off was because Judge Vincent and Judge Kaufman, who strongly hated communists, got the justice that was going to let this be proven and let them not go to de let them not go to death. They actually got him impeached and went ahead and put the Rosenbergs to death. They but impeached they, Douglas. And they had strong, very strong hatred toward any communist faction or anyone who was communist. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Hammond. And um, before I uh, introduce the man of the hour over here, um, I'd like to kind of restate what she uh, talked about earlier about what this class uh, for us has been. Um, the name itself uh, is first year seminar uh, investigation, so we have gone into a lot of uh, critical thinking about what goes into research on cases such as um, everything from serial killers to cases of espionage. And we also talked about the ideas of how media impacts the lives of many and biases our way of thinking. Um, like I said, uh, the two main, two main uh, assignments we were given was one that we had to, we were assigned a uh, person that had an important role in this case, and we had to research them and then present to the class what they did and how important they were. And we then took this um, information that we researched and applied it to our next, applied it to our next uh, assignment, which was, we were split into two halves. One half was the prosecution the other half. The long distance students and, uh, can't hear. Okay. We took the information we gathered from our specific characters and we researched even more on our side of the case. And we had our discussion, which we can hopefully view here in a little bit. And I would now, at this time, like to introduce our class. Class, will you please stand as I say your name? Jamie Alby, Dallas Bryan, Caitlin Dillon, <laughs> Megan Endicott, Madeline Flanagan, Brandon Gibson, Stephanie Hansel, Alyssa Johnson, Kirsten Jorgensen, Joshua Kelly, Casey Lobo, 
Gregory Miller, Michael Morris, Ethan O'Dell, Eric Pia, Morgan Pratt, Jordan Sargent, Alexis Williams, and Shelby Wilma. Great. It was a lively debate, but the bottom line is that um, we actually had very interesting discussions and debates. The assignments were, were very rich, and they looked into Mr. Maripol's life. They looked into the case, and it was, it was positively exhilarating. I'd like to say to you all that you've taught me a great deal through this process. It's been a pleasure talking and working with you and teaching you. Um, I really feel like Marshall University is extremely lucky to have this caliber of student. I feel like these students are going to go far in life and that they're going to really be major contributors, positive contributors to the world. I believe that you've shown yourselves to be good critical thinkers. And I'm really, really pleased with that. So with that, I'll turn this over. You can introduce Mr. Mirapol, and we'll get on with this process. Are they back on? Will you make you big again? <laughs> yeah. Can you see now? Nope. We see the computer screen. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this man is an attorney. He's the co-author of the book, We Are Your Sons, The Legacy of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, author of An Execution in the Family, One Son's Journey. And he's the founder and was the executive director of the Rosenberg Fund for Children, which is a foundation for children who, like he and his brother, were impacted by the imprisonment and or death or death of parents. I cannot stress enough how meaningful it is that he is here today. We would like to thank him for accepting our invitation and being here to speak to us, answer our questions, and inform us even more about his life. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Miracle. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So first, uh, I'll start off with a little apology. Uh, you may notice a whole bunch of water here, and you may see me attempt to surreptitiously grab some tissues, uh, which uh, is pretty difficult under these circumstances to be surreptitious. Uh, I, uh, I visited my grandchildren over the weekend, and of course when you visit your grandchildren you bring them a present and they obliged by returning a present to me. That is a cold. Uh, so uh, hopefully my voice will hold out uh, and that will be the end of this issue. Um, I want to, before starting, thank, uh, well, Peg Harmon for inviting me and for, and Thank you for your introduction and all of you folks for turning out on, on what appears to be a beautiful day. Um, and uh, also for all showing up here. Uh, and, and finally, everyone else involved in the process of bringing me here. It, it's been a very good experience. Um, now, what I want to do, and I don't know if we can get um, uh, the map of Lower Manhattan up on the screen. Uh, we, we're, uh, There's no sound to that one. Yeah, that's right. We don't need to. Uh, because I want to start out with some personal information that's not usually, uh, there you go, that's not usually um, presented when talking about my parents' case. This is Lower Manhattan. Uh, it's a rather, uh, my parents, uh, I grew up, the house that I 
came, or the high-rise apartment that I was brought to after my birth <laughs> was, you see where it says Manhattan Bridge? Was right at the end of the Manhattan Bridge, where, just below where it says Lower <laughs> East Side. Knickerbocker Village in New York City. Over there, the World Trade Center, where the Twin Towers were. Um, and right by where it says City Hall, just below that, was Foley Square, which was the, where the federal courthouse was that uh, my, the trial took place. So all of this is taking place within walking distance. This whole thing is a mile. You could walk around there. Uh, it's like you could, you could virtually look out the window of the top floor of the courthouse and see the house where my parents lived. This was where it all took place. Um, both of my parents were born on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. They lived in the area, do you see that street above Lower East Side that says Delancey? That's approximately where they lived when they grew up. Um, now, Ethel, my mother, was born in 1915. Her 100th birthday will come up next September. Uh, Julius was born in 1917. They were raised in poverty. Uh, this was, during the 1920s and 30s, was actually a very difficult time for people living on the Lower East Side of New York. They both went to Seward Park High School in the neighborhood, and they were both star students. Uh, Ethel graduated high school at the age of 15. Uh, the stories I heard from her contemporaries were that Ethel had an, operate, an, um, an operatic singing voice. When she was a freshman, uh, she was pulled out of class and brought to the senior assemblies to sing the national anthem, which is kind of uh, ironic, I suppose, <laughs> given what happened. Um, uh, I've heard stories that when the students, including my mother, would walk to Seward Park High School in the wintertime and there was snow on the ground. They would stuff newspapers into their shoes to prevent the snow from coming into the holes so their feet wouldn't, feet wouldn't freeze. Uh, Ethel took all the college preparatory courses because she wanted to go to college. But when she graduated in 1930, the Depression was raging, there was no money, she had no parental support, uh, it wasn't usual for women to go to college at that point. Um, and so she took a secretarial training course, became a typist, and sought work uh, as a secretary. Um, my father, Julius, graduated, then went to City College of New York, CCNY, uh, which at that point was free. Imagine that. You could get a college education for free. Uh, perhaps things have gone downhill a bit since then. Um, Ethel finally landed a job. She worked in the garment district in the area that were commonly known as sweatshops. People were underpaid, overworked, uh, and in, 19, in the summer of 1935, she was instrumental in leading a strike. At that point, she was a month shy of her 20th birthday. So she helped lead a strike when she was 19, which I assume is about the age of many of the people here in this room right now. Um, let me quote from the August 31st, 1935 New York Times article about this strike. About 150 young women pickets moved in squads through the garment district. They lay on the pavement in front of trucks and dared the drivers to move. Well, how did the company respond to Ethel's leadership of the strike? Well, they fired her. But this was 1935, no longer the 20s. Roosevelt was in office. And he had recently empowered something called the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, to hear workers' grievances. 
And so Ethel took her case to the newly formed NLRB. And in the very first volume of their reporting on cases, there's actually a case. Ethel Gringlass, which was her maiden name, versus, I forget the name of the company. And here's a quote, uh, the NLL, NLRB then found in her favor. And here's what they said. This is reading from the reporting, the first volume. There is no allegation or evidence that she was not an efficient employee. The company's antagonism to Ethel Gringlass undoubtedly arose by virtue of the fact that she was active in organizing the union, was a member of the first and second committees, and had urged fellow employees who were working, who were working after a fellow union organizer's dismissal to cease working and protest against it. Well, so she won her case, but then the employer appealed to the court system, which was much more conservative, and her case was overturned. So she never got reinstated. Ethel remained active in union organizing, primarily by employing her singing and acting talents to raise funds at union benefits. She met Julius Rosenberg while performing at such a benefit, and they were later married. But what about their politics? Well, they were raised on the Lower East Side of New York City. The Lower East Side of New York City uh, was politically quite radical, particularly during the Depression. In fact, the lower, this area elected the only member of the New York City Council who was actually an out and known member of the Communist Party. Uh, how did they come to have their politics? Well, from their personal experience. They looked out their windows, and one of the things that constantly happened during the Depression in their neighborhood is that families couldn't pay the rent. So the landlords would hire goon squads who would come in during the day, remove all the family's furniture, throw it in the street and their belongings, and then lock, change the locks on the apartments and throw the families out. The Communist Party then came along after sundown. They organized squads of young people who broke the locks, moved the furniture back into the apartments, and the families moved back in. So there was guerrilla warfare going on, in a way, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And the Communist Party was seen by the people watching this as heroes. Then, so they became very sympathetic. And then they would go to a Communist Party demonstration in Union Square in New York. And the police would come on their horses with their batons and beat the demonstrators. And the next day, they would read in the newspapers that the communists had rioted in Union Square and the police came and restore order, restored order. So what did they learn from this? They learned that the communists were heroes and that the press lied. They knew it with their own eyes from their own experience. Their mistake was that they then extrapolated this knowledge to what was going on in the Soviet Union. If the capitalist press said that Stalin was a brutal dictator who was killing a lot of people, well, they were just telling lies just like they were telling lies about the demonstrations in Union Square. That, I believe at least, was their error. But that's where their politics came from. They were married on June 18, 1939. They had two children, my older brother Michael, born in 1943, and me born in 1947. During the war, Ethel became the only full-time volunteer of a new organization called the East Side Defense Council. The East Side Defense Council organized blood drives and speeches on the importance of the war effort. It became a model for other councils that were established all over the country. Julius Rosenberg had very bad eyesight. He was not accepted in the Army. And in 1941 or 1942, he decided to help our ally, 
the Soviet Union, who was also fighting against the Nazis. Um, and what he did, since he was an electrical engineering student at CCNY and knew lots of other young men who were becoming technicians and scientists in this area, uh, he recruited his friends into a ring of people who decided they were going to do what they could to help the Soviet Union defeat the Nazis. Now, without actually joining the army. Now, who were these people, these young people who were in their 20s, mostly in their early and mid-20s? Well, some of them were married couples. Some of them had kids, as my parents did. They were their friends. They were their buddies. Um, and the question arises, how could they do this? How could they engage in this kind of activity, which was clearly illegal, even though they were helping an ally, when they had small children? How could they put their children at risk? Well, from their perspective, they were doing this for their children. The Nazis were raging across Europe. Who knows what they were going to do? And of course, since most of these people were Jewish, the Nazis posed a very special threat to them and their children. So rather than doing this kind of activity out of neglect of their children, in their mind, they were doing it to benefit their children. Um, Okay, this activity ultimately led to my parents' trial in Foley Square Courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Uh, but the question is, was this trial or was their activity really about the secret of the atomic bomb? Well, and what did David and Ruth Gringlass, my mother's younger brother, David Gringlass, and his wife, Ruth, uh, what did they have to do with this? Because they became the chief prosecution witnesses against my parents. Well, David and Ruth Greenglass testified at my parents' trial that Julius and Ethel Rosenberg recruited David into an espionage ring in 1944. Now, David Greenglass was an army sergeant. He worked as a machinist fabricating pieces of the atomic bomb at a secret army base in Los Alamos, New Mexico. David and Ruth Greenglass testi also testified that in June of 1945, David <coughs> gave a spy courier named Harry Gold a drawing of the triggering mechanism of the bomb and that the courier identified himself when it, he came to the Gringlass apartment with a code phrase, I come from Julius, which was, of course, incriminating because my father's first name was Julius, and that he also handed a half of a cut Jell-O box top. Now, maybe for the younger folks, I have to explain a little bit because Jell-O comes in plastic containers these days, but it used to come in these cardboard boxes. And what Gold testified, or what the green glasses had testified to, is that my father took a top of a jello box top, cut it in an irregular shape, handed half of it to David and Ruth Greenglass, and said the courier would have the other half. So when the courier came and knocked on the door and said, Julia sent me, and handed a half a jello box top to David, he said that Ruth went to her purse, took out the other half of the jello box top and they matched and therefore they knew that this person was legitimate and they gave this sketch to him. Now, David and Ruth Greenglass uh, also testified that in September of 1945, just after the war ended, that there was a meeting at the Rosenberg apartment and that David Greenglass handed a sketch that was the cross-section of the atomic bomb. This is what the prosecution called the greatest secrets known to mankind. Okay? Uh, they testified 
that Ethel was present at this meeting, that my mother was present, and that David had scrawled some handwritten notes that went along with this sketch, and that she as a typist typed up the notes. Um, now, what do I think actually happened? Well, I think it's quite possible that my father was involved in involving David Greenglass in something. Okay, if you go to the KGB files, which were open for a while, you discover that the recruiting of David Greenglass was a little different according to their files from what the Greenglasses ultimately testified. According to the KGB files, when Ruth Greenglass was first presented with the idea of David helping, uh, David was already off in New Mexico, and this meeting took place between uh, my father and mother and Ruth Greenglass in my parents' apartment, that Ruth Greenglass was extremely enthusiastic about this, and that Ethel, in response to her enthusiasm, said, was silent except for saying one thing, be careful. Now, of course, the statement, be careful, is ambiguous. Uh, does it mean don't get caught? Or does it mean maybe this isn't such a good idea after all? We don't know. Uh, Ruth's version w instead was that she was reluctant to, join, to talk to David about this and that she had to be persuaded and that my mother weighed in by saying, let David decide. The other question about the recruitment of David Greenglass has to do with who told whom about. See, David Greenglass testified that Julius told him that he was sent to Los Alamos to work on the atomic bomb, the new super weapon. Uh, however, when the NSA files, the Venona transcriptions were revealed in the mid-1990s, according to them, Julius was ignorant of the atomic bomb project. So how did he know to tell David that he was working on this project? Well, I believe, and I can't prove this, well, one thing I know is that David Greenglass was a braggart. Everybody who knew him at Los Alamos and other places talked about how he was a, st a street smart, wise guy who liked to shoot off his mouth and make himself more important than he actually was. My guess is, is that when David was sent to Los Alamos, he bragged to my parents about the important work he was doing. And so rather than Julius telling David about the project, David actually told Julius about the project. But we never know. What we do know from these same secret files that the NSA had and were not released until 1995 was that, well, Julius worked for the Army Signal Corps of Engineers during World War II. But in February of 1945, he was fired because they found out he was a member of the Communist Party. The KGB files reveal that when they found out that Julius Rosenberg was fired in February of 1945, they got very upset. They assumed that the FBI must have realized that he and this group of young people were passing military industrial information to the Soviet Union, and they suspended him. They took all his contacts away and gave them to other people. Uh, one researcher said they gave him a pink slip. I don't think it was quite a pink slip. I think they just suspended him. At that point, the meeting that ultimately took place in June several months later had not been arranged. So Ruth Greenglass was given the job of taking over the recognition signal and the code phrase. Let's step back for a second and talk about Venona. What was Venona? The Venona project was a secret project that the National Security Agency 
I don't think it was actually called that in those days, but I'll use the current phrase, uh, was involved in decrypting. You see, what happened was whenever there was a transmission of information from people who were helping the Soviet Union and the United States to the Soviet Union, it wasn't just like somebody sent a message, you know. Uh, no, what they did was they wrote a message out and then it was encrypted. What that meant was that each letter was assigned a number. So instead of words, what you had was a string of numbers. But that wasn't enough. What the Soviets did was they double encrypted it. So that meant that the string of numbers, let's say the number four, every time you saw the number four uh, on the final encryption, it wasn't really the number four, it was some other number and you had to have a deciphering book to tell you that every time they said the number four, that really meant the number eight. And the number eight stood for the eighth letter in the alphabet. And in the year before computers, the years before computers, it was almost impossible to decipher this kind of double encryption. But the Soviets get, got sloppy. Some of the messages were not double encrypted. They reused some of the codes. And the result is, is that people working tirelessly at the NSA were able, starting in 1948 or starting in 1944, but up till 1948, to decrypt bits and snippets of these messages. Um, and, one of the, and that's how, and those bits and sniff, snippets were kept secret, were not presented at my parents' trial, and were not released until 1995. And it's at that point uh, that we found out about this. Well, what did we find out? Well, first of all, one of the Venona transcriptions, perhaps one of the most remarkable ones, is from the spy whose who my father was, but he had a code name, uh, so he wasn't called Julius. No one's ever mentioned by name if they're given codes in any of these things. He sends a message to the Soviet Union after the recruitment of David Greenglass that someone else needs to deal with David Greenglass because Julius is ignorant of the atomic bomb project. Uh, what's more remarkable about the Venona transcriptions is that Ethel is never given a code name, but Ruth Greenglass is given a code name. The chief decryptor of the project says what this means is that Ethel was not involved in espionage work. Now, what about this whole decryption thing? How did it happen? Just to give you an example of, or, or the background on what happened in the 1940s, you see, you, what, there was a, tr it was the old days, there was old technology. The way that this information was sent from New York City or from Washington to Moscow was through the transatlantic cable. There was actually a, a big metal cable, a series of wires that was laid along the ground, the floor of the ocean from New York Harbor all the way to Europe. And this, of course, the American company which owned the cable provided all our intelligence agencies with everything that was transmitted by the cable. But the Soviets weren't worried about this because they had double encrypted everything. So they thought, who cares whether the Americans look at this string of numbers? They're not going to be able to figure anything out. But they evidently did figure a little bit out. Now, so Ethel's never given a code name. Julius is ignorant of the atomic bomb project. But Julius is involved in spying. The trail ultimately leads, leads to David Greenglass, and he confesses. Did this happen through Venona or through some other FBI research? We don't really know. But the FBI, when they got a hold of Julius and looked at the Venona transcriptions, 
They were not particularly interested in him because he was a master atomic spy. After all, they knew he was ignorant of the atomic bomb project. But because Julius was not a particularly good scientist. Uh, he was not known for his scientific ability. What he was known for was he was charismatic. He was politically articulate. He was the recruiter. He's the one who got other people involved in this process. So the FBI wants Julius not because he's a master spy, but because if they can get him and get him to confess, they can get a lot of other people. In other words, and as one of the assistant prosecutors in my parents' case ultimately said, uh, if we could only get this guy to cooperate, we'd have the biggest spy case in the history of the world. Well, I don't know if that's true. But they were after not quality so much, but quantity. And that's what led them, at least in part, to charge my parents not with espionage or not with treason, but with conspiracy to commit espionage. And this is very important, because what does a conspiracy mean? Well, in legal terms, a conspiracy in, takes place whenever two or more people get together and take one act in furtherance of an illegal plan. That's all you need. So you don't need physical proof to convict people of conspiracy. You don't need to show that anybody actually gave anything to anybody, just that they planned to do it. And the result is, is the evidence is all about conversations and the jury's decision on guilt or innocence is really about who do they believe. It's about credibility and conversations. Uh, so despite the fact, but despite the fact that he says he's ignorant of the atomic bomb project or the Soviet files say, show that, uh, in order to increase the pressure on Julius to cooperate, they call him in the press the master atomic spy. And then they arrest Ethel and charge her with the same crime, and they both face the death penalty. They face the death penalty not because the FBI wants to execute them, but because the FBI wants to coerce them into cooperating. It's after that that David and Ruth Greenglass make up the September 25th meeting about the secret of the atomic bomb. That's when David and Ruth Greenglass make up Ethel's presence in doing the typing. You see, one of the reasons I can say this with confidence is one of the strangest things about my parents' case is how much prosecutorial material is public because of my brother and my Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that we filed in the 1970s, we ultimately forced the release of 300,000 pieces of paper, secret files. And those files include the original statements of David and Ruth Greenglass. And they don't talk about September 25th, and they don't talk about Ethel's presence at all. It's only later, in later statements a few weeks before the trial, that the government re-interviews them and that's when all this new information surfaces. And finally, the judge, one of the things we got perhaps even more remarkable files, are communications between, secret communications between the judge and the prosecution. You know, the judge is not supposed to, a judge in a case is not supposed to secretly communicate with the prosecution because he's supposed to be neutral. But in this case, FBI files show that that's exactly what happened. And one of those files, one of the assistant prosecutors tells the FBI that he had a conversation with Judge Kaufman during the middle of the trial. In fact, the prosecution had just finished its case. The defense had not started to present its case. And uh, this Justice Department official tells the FBI he believes that Judge Kaufman is going to give the death penalty if the jury votes that they're guilty. And the, justice, the, the FBI official says, why do you believe that? And the Justice Department official, who was probably Assistant Prosecutor Roy Cohn, says, I know he will if he doesn't change his mind. So here's the judge deciding on the penalty before the jury's even reached a verdict. And that's what happens. The jury finds them guilty, and the judge gives them both the death penalty. And I'm just going to read you a very small portion of 
the sentence, his sentencing speech. I consider your crimes worse than murder, says Judge Kaufman. I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea with the resulting casualties exceeding 50,000 and who knows how many millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason. Now, despite Judge Kaufman's sentencing speech, no scientists actually testified at my parents' trial that the Russians perfected their bomb more quickly because of the sketch. In fact, chief atomic scientists, people like Dr. Harold Urey, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, said there was no secret of the atomic bomb. And by the way, my wife always tells me that when I hold up this sketch, nobody can see it and it's worthless. Um, this is so I shouldn't do it. But you know, husbands don't always listen to their wives, you know. Uh, what else is new? Um, uh, this is the cross-section sketch of the atomic bomb. It says down here, it says Exhibit 8, uh, March, it's date stamped March 12, 1951, right in the middle of the trial. Down below it says cross-section A-bomb not to scale. I'm going to give it, you can pass it amongst you and see what it looks like. According to the prosecution, this is the greatest secrets known to mankind. When you look at it, you'll discover that it looks like, like a cross-section of an apple pie. Um, but you can make your own determination. Uh, actually, during the 1970s, when my brother and I were involved in the beginning of the reopening effort, we actually had T-shirts made up of this uh, sketch. A and you know, people would say, what's that? And we'd say, oh, that's the secret of the atomic bomb. It was a good way to start a conversation. Uh, uh, we never did use it as a pickup line, though. Um, anyway, uh, so, uh, my parents also had a co-defendant named Morton Sobel, I should mention. Because no evidence was ever presented against him that he was involved in atomic activity, he was given a 30-year prison sentence. Um, the FBI gave the death penalties, as I said, or I should say the prosecution, the judge gave the death penalties, the FBI supported them. As agents later wrote, years later, they didn't want them to die, they wanted them to talk. So in, in this case, the death penalty was used to coerce cooperation. It wasn't for punishment purposes, it was kind of a way to extort cooperation. And when you come to my mother's case, where we have prosecutorial documents in which they say that my, the evidence against Ethel Rosenberg is weak and that they're going to arrest her to use her as a lever to get my father to cooperate. Uh, and the FBI files, whenever they talk about my mother, they always describe her as cognizant and recalcitrant. They never describe her as guilty. And then we received from, through our Freedom of Information Act, a list of questions that the FBI was going to ask my father when he agreed to cooperate. In fact, they were so sure that at the last minute, the talk, when, it said, when they said talk or die, that they would talk instead of dying. So they even prepared questions to ask my father. The sixth question on the list was, was your wife Ethel cognizant of your activities? Not was she guilty, but was she aware? That's an amazing question to ask about somebody uh, who you're about to execute. Now, they didn't, note, you know, they didn't make up a list of questions to ask Ethel uh, because they didn't think she knew anything, evidently. Now, okay, what have we learned most recently? On September 11, 2008, almost all the transcripts of the testimony given by witnesses before the grand jury. You know the way our prosecutorial system works. Uh, uh, perhaps those in the class learned this. The prosecution presents to a grand jury in secret the evidence they have against someone and then the grand jury decides whether to indict them. And then this evidence is all sealed to protect the grand jury's uh, anonymity. 
Finally, in 2008, because of the historic importance of this case, a judge agreed that all the transcripts of the grand jury testimony of people who, were, who had died or who gave permission could be released to the public. Ruth Greenglass died earlier that year. Uh, David Greenglass had not yet died. His testimony was not released, but Ruth Greenglass's was. And under oath before the grand jury, as a cooperating witness, Ruth Greenglass made no mention of the September 25th meeting, the September 1945 meeting I talked about, no mention of the cross-section sketch that is going around the room, no mention of Ethel's presence at the meeting, and no mention of any typing. This caused a sensation in the mainstream media. There was an awful lot of publicity about this because for the first time they questioned whether Ruth's trial testimony about Ethel's presence in typing, which was essentially the only evidence against my mother other than that statement that Ruth Gray gave, uh, let David decide. That's the only evidence against my mother. Actually, it's remarkable because, you know, Th that evidence of her typing, I believe, is a lie. But even if it were true, it would mean that the United States government executed someone for typing. Um, but so the press began to say, well, you know, maybe Ethel was uh, not guilty after all. Now, by the way, there are, to this day, right-wing people in this country who, in fact, I saw an article online just the other day in which they talk about Ethel, that Ethel really was guilty. She laundered money for the KGB. She recruited people for the KGB. Uh, I don't know where they get this from. Uh, the idea that my impoverished parents were involved in money laundering uh, is laughable to me. But I just want to let you know that it's even though the mainstream has now come to see my mother as not really guilty, uh, it remains, I mean, I'm sure if you watch Fox News, you'll find out that both the Rosenbergs are totally and completely guilty um, of stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. Um, but anyway, uh, that's a digression. Uh, on the same day, September 11th, 2008, Morton Sobel, my parents' co-defendant, who's 93 years old and beginning to become a little senile, acknowledges for the first time that he and my father helped the Soviet Union. He said that the primary purpose of this help was to help the Soviet Union defeat the Nazis during World War II. In 2010, though, Sobel also said that they helped the Soviet Union after the end of the war in 1948. Had nothing to do with the secret of the atomic bomb. It was military, industrial espionage, radio, av aviation, various kinds of technical things. Uh, my brother and I believe Morton Sobel. I mean, he's now 97 and he was in this whole process losing his mind, but and you can't really trust the details of what he says. And actually, what he says one day and what he says the next day don't necessarily match. But that doesn't mean none of this is true, that the, the gist of it doesn't have truth. So I think I'm pretty confident that my father did help the Soviet Union during the 1940s. But there's more. In a relatively new book called Final Verdict by Walter and Miriam Schneer, published in 2010, we finally learned what really happened. What Walter Schneer discovered when reviewing the NSA and the KGB files that were available was, that, was something very perplexing. There were three incidents of major atomic espionage. One was a senior atomic scientist named Klaus Fuchs, who provided detailed information to the Soviet Union. A second was a junior atomic scientist named Theodore Alvin Hall, who supplied vaguer information. And the third was the Green Glass sketch. The first two sets of material were transmitted instantly to the Soviet Union within a couple of days because they were considered very important. Anything having to do with the atomic bomb immediately went out 
to the Soviet Union. But the Greenglass sketch didn't arrive in Moscow until December 27, 1945, three months after the supposed September meeting. And they, he couldn't figure out why there was this three-month delay. It didn't make any sense. Walter Schneer finally put it together just before he died. Yes, Julius Rosenberg was involved in military-industrial espionage in 1944, but he was inactivated, as I said, February 23, 1945, because the Russians feared that the FBI was on to him. That's why he got fired from his Signal Corps job. Uh, so the KGB on February 17th assigned the work of the code phrase, of the jello box top, to Ruth Greenglass. Remember I talked about that earlier. In other words, there really was a jello box top, there really was a recognition signal, but Ruth created them, not Julius. Now imagine being my parents and sitting in the trial and hearing Ruth and David swear that Julius did this when my parents knew that they were not involved in any of this. No wonder Harry Gold and David Greenglass were brought together a few weeks before the trial to iron out, to figure out what the code phrase was. You know, Julius was inactivated months before the June meeting took place. No one was coming from Julius. The KGB would never prevent allow Harry Gold and David Greenglass to use the first name of a spy they felt the FBI was onto in a code phrase. Uh, moreover, that supposed meeting between the Greenglasses and the Rosenbergs in September could never have taken place because Julius Rosenberg was suspended from activity. Instead, what Walter Schneer discovered was that Ruth Greenglass, on her own, without Julius and Ethel's help, or involvement, met with Soviet agents on December 25th, 1940, or December 21st, not Christmas Day, September 21st, 1945, and delivered David's sketch, what the U.S. government called the secret of the atomic bomb, the sketch that most of you have seen. In other words, the green glasses did it and pinned it on the Rosenbergs. And that's why the sketch doesn't show up in Moscow until December 27th. There was no big delay, not three months. It only took six days to get to Moscow. This staggering new information changed my view of the green glasses. I now knew, know that they actually did it and pinned it on my parents. Now keep in mind that the green glass sketch that you've seen is full of errors. It wasn't of any use to anybody. Scientists have said it was worthless. But it makes the green glasses' actions more reprehensible than I even imagined. But the green glasses' greater villainy doesn't exonerate our government. Uh, the government played an active role of, in inventing evidence against both my parents. The government knew the green glass sketches were worthless, yet continued to portray my parents as master atomic spies. And the ultimate result is that the government executed two people for an act they did not commit. But how did our court system, and this may be the most important point to learn of all, how did our court system get to this point? Well, I've mentioned the NSA and KGB files a lot of times. Clearly, the courts back in the early 1950s knew nothing about what was in the KGB files. They weren't open till decades later. But what about the NSA files? Well, it turns out that the NSA shared them with the CIA, and the CIA shared them with the FBI, and the FBI shared them with the Justice Department officials, that is, the prosecutors involved in the case. And then the prosecutors shared them with the judge. I can't prove this, but this is what I believe. What did the prosecutors reveal to the judge? Well, they revealed that Julius Rosenberg was a KGB spy who had a series of code names and provided the KGB with secret information. And that he connected David Greenglass to the KGB. 
Uh, well, but what they didn't tell the judge was the part of the Venona transcriptions in which Julius is ignorant of the pro uh, atomic bomb project and which say that Ethel was not involved. So the prosecutors shared part of the information with the judge enough so that the judge knew before the trial began that the defendants were guilty. And he was a patriotic American. He was going to do his patriotic duty and hand out the stiffest penalty possible. And he was probably so arrogant, and given what I know of Judge Kaufman, he was extremely arrogant, that he never believed that the FBI would actually be fooling him and only showing him part of the information, not all of it. Now, of course, this wasn't legal. It subverted the whole nature of our court system. The judge ends up becoming part of the prosecution team. The presumption of innocence goes out the window. The right to confront and cross-examine evidence against you goes out the window. So my parents' trial turns out to be a joke. But that's how they ended up executed for something they didn't do, although one of them did something else illegal. Okay. So what about today? Let me conclude with a little bit about today, because it's not just about history. Remarkably, Chelsea Manning was charged under the same Espionage Act as my parents. Edward Snowden is told that if he comes back to this country, he will be charged under the exact same act. And about a month ago, I spoke at uh, Boston University. My brother and I became the custodians of all my parents' handwritten prison correspondence. Hundreds of letters that they wrote back and forth while they were in prison. Uh, this is a unique set of documents. There's no similar correspondence that I'm aware of in the history of the world between two people who are sitting on death row husband and wife with small children about to be executed. Well, we kept them in a safe deposit box. We didn't know really what to do with them. I'm not an archivist. Finally, we gave them to the Boston University Archive. Um, and Boston University, at the end of last year, Boston University then held a grand opening of this new archive, the Rosenberg Letters, uh, last month. And we spoke on a panel. And the panel included a number of experts. Uh, one of them, one professor at Boston uh, University, had been a CIA agent for 35 years and was now teaching uh, in their political science department. Other members of the panel included other experts in this field. And what shocked me when I found out about this, you'll have to excuse me for a minute, um, when I found out about this, was that all the panelists, even the CIA agent, were more sympathetic to my parents than they were to Edward Snowden. This kind of shocked me, because my father really did work for the KGB. So I thought about this. How could this be? Now, of course, they knew 60 years had passed, so that's different from something happening today. And of course, it's now clear to these people that my mother was not really involved. So maybe that had something to do with their sympathy. But then I thought, you know, there's a key distinction between Manning's case and Snowden's case and my parents' case. I view what Manning did in releasing some of these videos and what Snowden did in revealing all of the secret information as a gift to the world. Uh, there's a big difference between deciding who gets the secrets versus whether the secrets are necessary to begin with. In other words, there's a big difference from taking something secret from one country and giving it in secret to another country versus revealing what's secret to the entire world. When you think about it, in some ways, what the CIA agent was saying, yes, Julius might have worked for the wrong side, but he played by the rules. 
by our rules. You know, he was, it was illegal. But Snowden threatened the basis upon which these secret agencies operate. The very basis of secrecy. You know, when you think about it, I used to say this and I still believe it's true, that the Russian secret agencies and the American secret agencies are probably both better at keeping secrets from their own publics than they are from keeping secrets from each other. That they interpenetrate each other. In fact, they justify each other's existence. So when someone comes along and reveals all the secrets, all of a sudden it threatens their existence. So in some ways what Snowden did was much more radical and also particularly dangerous because the danger is that it presents the very popular idea that we the people have a right to know what the government is doing in our name. That's what's so dangerous about this. It's not only that the secrets are revealed, but in the process of revealing them, the public likes what you're doing. Now those who support secrecy say it is needed for our protection. But if you think about it, doesn't that require that we trust the government? What Manning and Snowden has demonstrated with the material they released is that the government is not worthy of that trust. So I think that's why these panelists were much more disparaging of Snowden than they were of my parents. Because it ultimately made their position that secrets are necessary untenable. Thank you. So it's 11.13 uh, and so that means we have time for some discussion, uh, right? We have till 11.30, right? We do. Some of our students will have to leave okay. before, but we do. And thanks everyone again for coming this evening. Mr. Maripol will be at BE 105 in the Memorial Student Center at 7, from 7 to 9 as well. And I'll be, talking, be I'll be talking about something entirely different tonight. I'll be focusing on my childhood, how it led me to the Rosenberg Fund for Children, and uh, the death penalty. Uh, so I hope to see some of you there, but questions. And don't be, you know, people sometimes get nervous that they might have a question that might be difficult for me. It might be of a more personal nature. I wouldn't be up here doing this if, if that were problematic for me. Um, so. I would like to say one thing. The students actually came to many of these conclusions, and you uh. know you did, with the Jell-O box, with, with uh, David and Ruth. So we're right on. Go for it. Question, yeah, in the back. Yes. Um, I want to know, were, were your mother's parents alive during the trial? Because you essentially have your uncle and his wife testifying against your parents. And I just wonder if they were alive, what that cost them. Um, well. My, father, my, my grandfather was not alive, okay? My grandmother, Tessie Greenglass, was alive, and she actually sided with the government, went to visit my mother in prison, and, well, I'll tell you the whole story. It's a, a little bit of a preview of tonight, but uh, my brother and I were actually living with Tessie Greenglass uh, after my parents were arrested. And she went to my mother in prison and said, why don't you back David's story? And so she was trying to get my mother to leave her husband and back uh, her brother. And Ethel said, you mean you want me to lie? And, and Tessie said, it doesn't matter whether it's a lie. Uh, you should back David. Look what he faces. Of course, she faced the death penalty, but uh, I guess her mother cared more about her son than her daughter. Uh, uh, Tessie then, when my mother refused, said, well, you know, the boys are driving me crazy. If you don't agree to testify, I'm going to throw them in a shelter. 
And so she then took us and dropped us in a shelter uh, and refused to have anything to do with us uh, in order to try to coerce my mother. So uh, Tessie Greenglass uh, was, was not one of the nicer people in the world. And, uh, and that's, that's how she reacted. I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, you know, I, this is the McCarthy period. People were terrified. There were uncles and aunts on both sides of the family. Uh, ultimately, I went to live with my father's mother, Sophie Rosenberg, um, because uh, she'd been hospitalized. She'd been sick, and so she couldn't take us in. When she got well, uh, she, uh, the uncles and aunts paid to set up an apartment that we could go live in because they were too terrified to bring us into their homes. So we were basically, except for our grandmother, so that after my parents were executed, uh, we ended up being adopted outside of the family because there was nobody in the family who was, would take us in, and my grandmother was just not healthy enough to do it herself. Yeah, I actually know that. I'm from Massachusetts, so I actually know that you were adopted and raised in Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I know that there, I read a story in the New York Times, I guess about a month ago, David Greenglass just passed away. Yes. Uh, and they had a spread about his life and the, the family betrayal that happened, and it was very, I, I, I'm 29, so I'm, I'm very far removed from the situation, but it's very um, stirring to read that, you know, just from an outsider's perspective. I was wondering, with David alive and then upon his death, how that uh, affected you personally? Is it something, did you have contact with him, or was it, was it something that, um, was it hard for him, hard for you to reconcile that he was still free and, and out? You know, for me, and again, this is getting into things that I'm going to be talking about tonight, uh, I have never had any contact with David at all. And I used to say when I first started public speaking in the 1970s, way back when, uh, that, you know, the problem with confronting someone who's a liar is that you never know when they're telling the truth, and so what good would it do? Uh, but the reality was that that's, that was a rationalization. I never wanted to have anything to do with David Greenglass because on some sort of personal level he just disgusted me. You know, that it wasn't rational. It was a sort of gut emotional feeling. And the way I dealt with David was to not think about him. To just, you know, put him in a box and put him away like he was dead to me. Which I understand is actually, uh, for Jews, is sort of a cultural trait. Uh, one of the things that family members who do things that are totally wrong and are unacceptable what, what some Jewish families will do is they'll actually sit shiva for that family member, which is something you do for someone who's died. So you actually pretend that they're dead. Uh, and in some ways, on an emotional level, that's what I did. Uh, but I harbored this hostility and anger until I started the Rosenberg Fund. When I started a fund to help children who were experiencing the kind of thing that I experienced as a child, I managed to channel all that hostility, all that negative energy, into doing something positive. And it wasn't like I forgave Gringlass. It's just he became irrelevant because I figured out a way to do something good with that experience. Uh, but when he died, you know, the one thing I will say, and this doesn't really address your question, is that we have now, we've begun the legal process of trying to get his grand jury testimony released because now that he's dead. And I expect that will happen sometime over the next several months. And I expect that his testimony, since I believe David and Ruth Greenglass were both rehearsed before the grand jury by the prosecution, that his testimony will pretty much echo Ruth's, that there'll be no mention of the cross-section sketch, no mention of the September meeting, and no mention of my mother's presence. And that will be real important because it will kind of confirm what we already know. But we'll see. We'll see whether that happens or not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, kind of an old guy. I'm bigger. I'm three years younger than you. Uh -huh. So I was around at the time some of these events were taking place, but of course I don't remember anything. But what I wanted to ask is, did you uncover any elements of anti-Semitism? Okay. Well, 
with one of the things that's, that's it's interesting within the Jewish community, okay, this is a very tense time. You're talking about just after the Holocaust. You're talking about 1950s, just five years after the Holocaust. I mean, think about September 11th and how important that is to America today still. Uh, and it's what, uh, 13 years later. Uh, we're just five years from the Holocaust. So the Jewish community in the United States is very nervous. The United States has brought, and there was just a New York Times article about this, over a thousand ex-Nazis into the United States and allowed them to live in the United States because they were helping us against the communists. You know, Werner von Braun, the famous rocket scientist, was brought over to help with our missile program. And so the Jewish community was pretty nervous about this, where, where this was all leading. And then all of a sudden you have this group of New York Jews charged with stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. Uh, so there was consternation within the Jewish community about what to do. There was actually a rabbinical uh, dissertation written at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, which is the Orthodox College, about what the Jews should do and what their response should be and how they should handle this. And that rabbinical dissertation was sealed for 40 years. That's how nervous the Jewish community was. Uh, and not that there was one single Jewish community, but the mainstream. So one of the ways that the Jewish community dealt with it was to say it's not anti-Semitism because we have a Jewish judge and Jewish prosecutors. Okay. Um, and the Committee to Secure Justice in the Rosenberg case decided they didn't want to focus on anti-Semitism uh, because they didn't need to. So, but how did it work? Well, I think Judge Kaufman, as a Jew, wanted to prove his loyalty by issuing a death sentence. So in this sort of convoluted way, in this underground way, anti-Semitism rears, rears its ugly head through the Jews deciding to be not, they don't want to coddle their co-religionists. So that's why you end up with Jewish prosecutors and you end up with the Jewish judge and you end up with them all supporting the death sentence to prove their loyalty to the United States. That's how anti-Semitism ends up playing a role. Uh, so it is not, it's subtle, it's not overt, uh, but I think it had that impact. Uh, let me weigh in the back. Um, and then I can tell that, I guess, you being placed in the foster period, it helped out immensely. What do you think your life would have been like had you been placed back with your family? Well, gee, it's really hard to say because I think that, um, uh, I think my life would have been totally different, okay, first of all. Uh, and, and it's really important that my brother and I were always kept together. Uh, that was, he was like an anchor as the older brother. Uh, for me, it was, it was essential. So the fact that we weren't split up was very important. And that, you know, when you're dealing with foster children and siblings often happens and can be really problematic. Um, but the rest of the family all wanted to put this case behind them. They were all terrified of it. They all, like, hid it in the closet. Uh, I think I would have been totally messed up because I think children, uh, it's natural for children to want to identify with their parents and to get some positive connection from their parents. Now, sometimes it's impossible. You know, if their parents are serial murderers or child abusers, well, you know, there's no way around that. Uh, but in this case, that wasn't the case. Uh, and the fact that I, were brought, I was brought up by people who were supportive of my parents and who taught me that my parents were good people, I think was essential to my mental health. Uh, so if I had been brought up in families where the opposite was the case, I think I would have been very messed up. Uh, and, and, you know, I have, I have a, someone who I haven't uh, spent all that much time with recently, but I used to spend time with back in the 1990s, uh, is, you know, the, the famous Sam Shepard murder case. Uh, well, they had a son who's exactly my age, 
uh, you know, and we, I became friendly with him uh, years later as adults and discovered that he lived in isolation with all of this being buried. And he never got over it. His experience was so much different. Uh, community and positive support and making a positive connection from a social work perspective and understanding that and trying to make that happen is absolutely critical. Uh, yeah, and then here. I, I am a lawyer, but I'm recovering. Um, uh, uh, I practiced, I was in private practice for a few years. I did a lot of business and tax law too that helped me uh, um, with the foundation work that I did. It actually led, enabled me to do some of the technical stuff that ultimately I did. But I really am not, I mean, I'm not a criminal defense lawyer. I, I never, I, people given my politics and life People are always surprised at the kind of law I went into, but. I, I just wanted to know, um, thank you. Um, it, is your brother also a lawyer, and do you, do you think that your next cold case in your childhood influenced you to go to law school? Well, um, no, my brother, my brother's uh, taught economics at a college for 40 plus years um, and is now retired. Um, so he's an economics professor, he's an economist, uh, not a lawyer. Uh, I, I think that this case actually, uh, it, again, in a sort of roundabout way, I went to law school in order to figure out a way to start a foundation in my parents' name. So it wasn't to try to, you know, get on a white horse and be a knight in armor helping people in my parents' situation, at least not directly. In fact, I knew when I went to law school that I would never go into criminal law because I didn't want the responsibility of dealing with people who might end up in prison or even worse, that that would be more than I could handle. Uh, so, and. Uh, really more the latter than the former. There, was, there are three parts to this. One is the green glass side of the family. I never had any contact with any of them. Um, then there was the Rosenberg side of the family, particularly with my uh, father's older sister who was very close to us. She would always uh, invite us. We'd always go to satyrs at their house. We would always see them. She was, I mean, she was really messed up by this case. Uh, and. Uh, um, and I think it, it, was, it was hard on her kids, too. Um, uh, one of the things I didn't realize was that it hurt, you know, it, it had an impact on my cousins as well. I think it's no accident that when they grew up, one went to Israel, one went to Southern California, they all moved as far away from my Aunt Ethel as they could. Uh, and I think that was no accident because she was really uh, neurotic about what happened to her younger brother. Uh, so we had some contact with them, but it was very uncomfortable. The, the Mirapol side of the family, particularly Ann Mirapol's side of the family, Abel Mirapol had almost no family. But Ann had a family, and they were wonderful people, and we integrated with them. And when I talk about my cousins, I'm talking about, you know, my daughter was in Chicago last weekend and was visiting with, with my cousins. I mean, they, that's who I think of as my family. Uh, yeah, straight on. First, antenna, and then it was transformed into liberal. Now, I don't think that had anything to do with Fox News and, you know, the liberal <laughs> traitors, uh, because back in the 1940s, I don't know why uh, that came out. Uh, Well, I mean, 
I think that the thing I, I'm, you know, I'm anti-capital punishment. I, I think that, that uh, and, and there are, I can, there are many, many reasons. But if you look at my parents' case, the aspect of capital punishment that my parents' case highlights is one that's not usually addressed. And that is governmental power. Uh, that if you give the government the power of life and death, which is essentially what happens with capital punishment, then that power will get abused. So that in my parents' case, the death penalty was used not as punishment, but in order to exact a certain, make a certain political point and get my parents to confess. So, and I think that from a sort of democratic political science perspective, again, which is not often addressed in death penalty events, uh, 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 debates, is that, uh, you know, if you look at the history of the United States, we rebelled against the sovereign, the king. The king is the sovereign. All rights flow from the king. The king is empowered by God over us. And we said, no, the people are sovereign. And if you look at the whole basis of the Constitution, uh, what's the basis of the Constitution? The people are sovereign, and they cede to the government those rights. Only those rights they specifically cede to the government, and the rest the people keep. Well, I don't think you want to cede the right of life and death to the government. That, to me, is anti antithetical to uh, a democratic process. Uh, that is not usually what's talked about. I can give you, you know, ten other reasons uh, about, about the death penalty. Uh, the one that I'll say most simply for now is that, uh, you know, the death penalty is a negative response to a negative. And unless you're doing some sort of mathematics, uh, you know, two negatives don't equal a positive. That, you know, we're told when we're six years old that two wrongs don't make a right, and yet the adults in this world seem to think that that's the case uh, over and over and over again. Uh, but I think that the, the basic wisdom that we learned when we were kids is actually the one that we need to follow, that two wrongs do not make a right. Uh, okay, I think the question in case was just the defense. The defense was, we, we have a defense lawyer who would never tried a major criminal case before in his life, overmatched by the government, uh, made some pretty serious mistakes. Uh, and the whole tactic of the defense was to try to be polite and to show that they respected the system. Well, the whole system was rigged, so that was, that was kind of a dumb move. Uh, so uh, I don't, but I think that if you look at that period and you look at the best defense attorneys in the country who were defending communists accused of espionage or perjury or anything else, they all lost all their cases. Uh, so I think that the best attorneys could have created a better record for us to work with, but I don't think they would have changed the result. Um, that's, that's my take. That said, there's one thing about Manny Block's defense that I used to attack him for that I now realize he was right about. Our position until 2010 was that the green glasses made all this stuff up, that the jello box top, the sketch, the code phrase didn't happen. That, uh, that the green glasses were weak, and in order to save themselves, they made up this story so that the government would treat them more leniently. 
Manny Block's position was that the green glasses pinned what they did on the Rosenbergs. Okay? When Walter Schneer's research finally came out, we realized that Manny Block was right, and we were wrong. There really was a jello box top, there really was a code phrase, there really was the sketch, and the green glasses pinned what they did on the Rosenbergs. Uh, that, I mean, you know, it is a humbling experience. I, I, I'm not the world's greatest, well, I don't know whether I'm the world's greatest expert on the Rosenberg case, I rather doubt I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm up there. Uh, there are very few people who know more about it. Uh, and Walter Schneer, who wrote this book just before he died in 2010, was probably the world's greatest expert, knew the most details. Uh, and, but in any event, it is a humbling experience to research a case like this for 40 years, to have access to inside information because of who I am, people will say things to me that they might not say to anybody else, and then discover that in a significant way you are wrong. And, and that's a, that should be a lesson for all of us. Uh, I bet there's no one in this room who doesn't really believe strongly in something that they will ultimately come to believe they were wrong about. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I, I think that's an extremely valuable educational lesson. Uh, uh, and, and it's perhaps one of the hardest things for people to, I think, you know, it always, sometimes I scratch my head and I wonder because I've now seen, I've lived long enough to see how often I've been wrong. I, I sometimes wonder, why is it so hard for people to admit that they're wrong? You know, especially because everybody's wrong sometimes. Uh, it's only human, and yet we have a very difficult time admitting it. Uh, uh, so, in any event, that's a rather, I, I took that somewhere else, but... It's a good lesson in critical thinking, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, is it 11.30? I, I, I've lost my watch so many times I now use my phone. Uh, yep, it's past 11.30. Thank you all. <laughs>